When I was six years old, I got to see and hear Helen Keller speak. I also got a big hug from Helen Keller. I looked up to Helen Keller and her talented, determined teacher, Ann Sullivan, who together with hard work achieved what most people thought was impossible. Loss of eyesight and hearing did not prevent Helen Keller from embracing life fully, from becoming highly accomplished and contributory. How? How did that happen? I'd like to introduce you to Libby. Libby was born 12 weeks too early. She spent three weeks on a ventilator. She lived her first 11 weeks in a neonatal intensive care unit. And at four months of age, she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. When we met Libby, she was 15 months of age. She couldn't sit or crawl, and she couldn't use the right side of her body. And a lot of the time, Libby was frustrated and not so happy. Libby was our first test case for a new form of high-intensity therapy. And on the first day, we constructed a cast for Libby. We put it on her left arm, the arm that she could and did use sometimes. And then, the next day, we began hard work. Have you ever noticed that when you work really hard at something you love, it feels like play? Well, with children, we play while we do hard work. So her dedicated and skillful therapist, Stephanie, who's here this evening, began blowing bubbles. And Libby could not pop them. So the bubbles were blown really near, and Stephanie prompted little small movements, facilitating, encouraging, gently pushing, so that every now and then, Libby did pop a bubble. And when Libby got good at doing that, we changed the rules of the game. And we now made Libby reach out farther. When she got good at farther, we went higher. We went all around. Here's a photo of Libby popping bubbles. She's a master bubble popper. And guess what she did next? She went and grabbed the bubble wand so she could make bubbles. That's the first time Libby ever grasped an object with her right hand. We worked with Libby for six hours a day, five days a week, three weeks in a row. And at the end of those three weeks, Libby, who could not sit or crawl when we met her, was able to support her weight, sit up on her own, reach out and grab food and feed herself, she could turn pages in a book, and she could give hugs. 
And then six months later, we did it again. That's a new cast you see on Libby. And after another round of therapy, this time, Libby could crawl on her own. She could walk with a walker, which requires two hands. She learned to move fingers individually. And actually, all on her own, she discovered she had a right arm and a left arm and a right hand and a left hand, and she could use them together. And she went over and she pushed, or actually, she shoved her twin brother. <laughs> we are pretty sure that wasn't a designated therapy goal. She discovered the power of self-initiated behavior, and she earned all of that progress. Getting ready for tonight, we contacted Libby and her mom and said, well, what's Libby up to nowadays? She's up to a lot. That's zip lining. That is not special adaptive prosthetic equipment. That's zip lining equipment she's wearing. She's a junior in high school, along with her twin brother, who, although equally premature, did not have the brain damage that Libby had. And she also is a quite accomplished artist with needlepoint. And she made this frog to share with you tonight. Libby, for us, was a pioneer because what we learned working with her set the stage for rigorous clinical trials with lots of children of different ages and different ability levels in many different cities. We now have conducted research with more than 400 children, and our success rate, people who changed every bit as much and sometimes more as Libby, is above 95%. The research evidence confirms there are three key ingredients to what we do. One, you have to begin by getting way out of your comfort zone, not doing things the way you used to do them, being willing to take on something really difficult that's new. Two, we corralled principles of reinforcement and learning that have been available for more than 50 years. Reinforcement and shaping, starting with little movements and making them go farther and higher. Actually, it's like continuous quality improvement, and it's described scientifically as successive approximations. And successive approximations begins with that word success. And you do more and more and more. Three, practice, practice, practice. And then how about doing it again? What do we think that Olympic trainers and Olympic athletes do? three and four hours a day every day. Piano teachers with those rare children who will be able to perform on a concert stage, the children practice about three or four hours a day. It's that intensity factor with the shaping and the successive approximations and getting out of a comfort zone that leads to these phenomenal transformations. Here at Tech, we continue to develop variations in new forms of high-intensity treatment. So we've now treated legs. We've treated children with rare genetic disorders. We're combining our treatments with technology and medicine. 
and now we're in the midst of testing what we call whole body treatment. And just two weeks ago, we worked with a boy who's 10 years old named Dale, and he knows that I'm talking to you tonight about him. He's probably one of the most motor-challenged children we've ever worked with. Dale's a great student, wonderful personality, lots of fun to work with, and really cooperative. But below his neck, not much works under his control. And in fact, his brain damage from neonatal encephalopathy was so extensive that his doctors and therapists never even thought he could sit up, roll over, or pull himself to standing. But he came here, and in that first week, and this is my favorite therapy moment with Dale, we had Dale on a great big bed and doing that successive approximation thing, we had him pushing back and forth and getting stronger and rolling over and rolling back. And when he realized what he did, we heard the loudest belly laugh we've ever heard, and he could not stop laughing or rolling. He was doing something that was so impossible for him to have imagined. And by the end of four weeks of therapy, he could sit all on his own, something that had never happened in 10 years, and he could pull to standing, and it's still difficult, and he's not all that steady, but he could do it, and he could do it again and again. He now wants to learn to swim, and he's going to come back this summer, and we hope he's going to go away swimming. But would you like to see a picture of Dale's brain before and then after treatment? Well, thanks to students and colleagues at our human neuroimaging lab, I can show you those pictures. And this is from functional MRI, so we're seeing dynamic networks in the brain lighting up and communicating with other parts of the brain. And here you see an image before, and the green marks, that's a little area corresponding to a hand knob. And in fact, Dale did have one part of his body that worked kind of well, and it is his right hand. And that's what allowed him to operate his phenomenal wheelchair and to touch screens so he could do so well in school and playing games. That's the part that slid up beforehand. And on the other side, not much is in yellow or orange showing electrical activity. Here's what his brain looked like functionally four weeks later. Lots more activity on both sides, more communication between those areas that are called the motor cortex and the sensory motor cortex, and there are parts lit up that had never been active before. So tune in and you'll be able to find pictures of Dale's brain this summer after he learns to swim. I now would like to reach out to you as students, teachers, scientists, clinicians, just caring people, and ask you to join us, invite you to join us, in making sure that we, when we have knowledge that's this certain, this powerful, in our hands, we put it to good use so that the maximum number of people can benefit from it. It might even be some of us need to step outside our comfort zone, try something really hard and new, 
find a teacher or a trainer or a therapist or a peer who is dedicated and skillful in helping us get better and better and then practice enough until it becomes part of who we are. And I hope that all of us can ourselves reach beyond what once seemed like limits. Thank you.